This is Bible Academy. We are in John chapter 19, verse 1. Now, before we get started, as always, we need to make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity and privilege and everything you've provided so that we can study your word. We ask now that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. When we left off last time, Jesus was still with Pilate, and Pilate had went outside and made the offer to release Jesus to the Jews. Since this was a Jewish custom on the Passover to release a prisoner. But with the Jewish leaders urging the crowd, they cried out for the release of a revolutionary leader named Barabbas. Pilate goes back into the Praetorium. We continue in chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Pilate would not have done this himself, of course, but he had his soldiers do it. Uh, that's why some of your translations will fill in. Uh, they had him flogged uh, severely like we had with the Net Bible and the NIV. And There's some interpretation going on here, as often there is in translations. The word for scourged, let's talk about that. The word is mas tigao. It means to scourge, whip, or flog. When Paul was about to be scourged by the Romans, he challenged them on the legality of it for an uncondemned Roman citizen. So it was a common practice, but not among the citizens, for the citizens to be scourged. It was for uh, foreigners, uh, those of a uh, non-citizen status of some sort. A pilot would have had Jesus scourged just to appease the Jews. He's already considered Jesus innocent. Perhaps if he did this, then they wouldn't insist on him being crucified, but that didn't work as we know. Let's talk about this scourging or sometimes called flogging. There are three levels of it. Let me show you um, the first two, then we'll talk about the third one. Fusti gatio. Less severe for light offenses. In other words, this is a light beating to kind of teach somebody a lesson. The next level, more severe, Flaga la tio, a severe beating for more hardened criminals, more serious offenses. The worst one, the one that nearly would bring people to death, or I should say uh, what we call beat them to death, Ratio, the worst beating that they would give. Let me describe this one. They would strip and then tie the victim to a post. Then they would have a succession of soldiers using a scourge. A scourge is a whip with leather thongs with pieces of bone and metal tied in on the ends. They would take turns, the soldiers would, beating the victim till they were exhausted or the commanding officer had called it off. This was so severe it could break a person's back. Witnesses report that it would strip the skin off, leaving the bones and entrails exposed. This often killed a person. From what we have seen, Pilate would have given 
Jesus one of the lesser severe beatings at this point because he was ready to release him and he thought he would this would at least teach Jesus a lesson while appeasing the Jews as was often the case the soldiers got involved in the mocking and inflicting various pains upon the victim as they did here with Jesus now let's talk about the level of flogging that Jesus got It's suggested here, as I suggested, this was a light beating. There are others who suggest that there was a second beating. Um, it's hard to find this in the text. And the reason they suggest that is because um, Jesus could not carry his cross, and a light beating would have not worn him out that much. Well, it's hard to be sure on this. So, knowing that Pilate wanted to teach Jesus a lesson, he wanted to give Jesus back to them, he wouldn't want to give them back Jesus in a nearly dead condition. There was no point in that. Well, let's continue on through the text. Verse 2. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they clothed him in a purple robe. Now they did this because Jesus claimed to be a king, the king of the Jews. So they mocked him, putting this twisted crown made of thorns that resembled what they call a radiant corona. This is one that was worn by the rulers at times and was seen on the statues of their gods in those days. Now there was a date palm that had thorns on it and these thorns could be as long as 12 inches. It is also these palms which branches were used by the people welcoming Jesus in just a few days earlier. Well, they put a purple robe on Jesus, the color for emperors. This is probably a, an old officer's cloak, which was actually dark red. Verse 3 tells us about their mocking. And they were coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and kept striking him in the face. Now these are what we call imperfect tenses. That means the action kept going on in the past. They kept striking him, repeated blows and slaps. So there's this continuing mocking of the soldiers coming up to him and calling out, Hail, King of the Jews. It appears that the soldiers, one after the other, came up to Jesus and bowed and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and then struck him in the face. All a big joke to them. Now this was going on inside the Praetorium. So Pilate is allowing all this to happen. Give Jesus all these insults and let him learn his lesson. Verse 4. Pilate came out again and said to them, that is the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Pilate figures he's had his beating, he's been insulted, he's basically a mocked person now. He says he's going to bring out Jesus, and here comes Jesus, beaten, bloody, swollen, Quite a pathetic sight. Weak, with this thorn crown, with the thorn sticking him in and around the head while he's wearing this purple robe. Pilate presents this half dead Jesus to the crowd, expecting the Jews to think he had had enough of this and that they had had their satisfaction. And then he makes the point. I am bringing him out to you 
so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. The idea of guilt is the word, let me just show it to you. You'll have different translations on this. No cause for guilt, no reason for guilt, uh, no charge, something like that. Itia, it means basically cause. So you're open to some interpretation here. There was no charge of a crime here. There was no basis for a charge. Same word used back in verse 38. Well, out comes Jesus, verse 5. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Now, Pilate has joined in on the mocking also. He says, Behold the man, this is what they wanted. The real truth is lost here in that Jesus was the man, the God-man standing before them, actually suffering for them and soon going to pay for their sins. It's another case of truth lost among pride and religion. Verse 6. Therefore, when the chief priest and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify, crucify. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I do not find in him guilt. Now again, let's paint the scene, because that's what John's doing for us. The sight of Jesus beaten and bloody did not move the Jews to show mercy. They cried out saying, Crucify, crucify. Pilate believed Jesus was innocent. He had an innocent man beaten, and they're still calling for his crucifixion. Now, they call for his crucifixion, which was reserved for major crimes against Rome. Sedition against the state meant crucifixion, and that is what the Jews want. That is the charge they're trying to convince Pilate to take seriously. But Pilate knew this wasn't the case, and he got angry. So he spouts off back to them, and it says, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I do not find in him guilt. This is the third time Pilate has declared that he did not see Jesus as guilty. He said he had no charge against Jesus. It was nothing. There was nothing there. Now Pilate says to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. He knew they couldn't do that legally. It was illegal. So this is a comment out of disgust for them by telling them to go crucify him themselves. This is a sarcastic taunt uh, for these pathetic Jews at this point and their rulers. Think of it, a pagan Roman ruler disgusted with religious Jews over the most holy and perfect Jesus. What a situation. Then the Jews reveal the main reason they wanted Jesus done away with. Listen to this. Now it gets really interesting. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Now, the phrase... Son of God, or title Son of God, means different things to different people. There was a teaching in Jewish law about one blaspheming God by claiming to be God. So now they are telling Pilate of this law of theirs and why Jesus is deserving, deserving of death. So if he wanted to get along with the Jews, basically, you need to let us have him killed. Listen to Leviticus 24 16a, first part of it. Leviticus 24, 16. 
Moreover, the one who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him. So when they heard uh, Jesus say things that implied that he was equal with God, this is their interpretation when they say, made himself out to be the Son of God, as the verse says. To them this was blasphemy in their eyes, and it was deserving of death. Jesus had claimed in so many words to be equal with God in his ministry. Let's look at some of those again. Chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. And he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but because he called God his own father, making himself equal with God. So the fact that Jesus claimed uh, God as his father implied that he was equal with God. That's also the meaning of the Son of God. He's equal with God. Uh, also in chapter 10, let's look at some verses there. 1030, I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones in order to stone him. That was another attempt. Verse 33, the Jews answered him, We do not stone you for a good work, but for blasphemy, and that you, a man, make yourself out to be God. So that was their conclusions already. And this is way back early in his ministry. Some of these, back in chapter 5. That was towards the beginning of his ministry. Now, Pilate is growing in fear regarding this entire situation. When they start uh, saying the term or the phrase, the title, Son of God, this intensified the situation for Pilate. Listen to verse 8. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. Now, there is no direct explanation what he was so afraid of, but we have to take consideration this context. And there are some good clues here. His fear could have come from one or any combination of three possible causes. Let's look at them. The first one, the most obvious, it appears that he is reacting to the Jews' statement that he made himself out to be the Son of God, that Jesus made himself out to be the Son of God. Now keep in mind, many of the Romans were a superstitious lot afraid of offending their gods or getting on the wrong side of them. Um, and when they start saying that he's a son of God, uh, Pilate could be thinking that he had just beaten and humiliated a god or perhaps a messenger of the gods or some sort of divine person. And remember that this is among a lot of religious Jews. So we have religion involved, we have superstition involved. A very misleading combination. A case where people can easily misunderstand, misinterpret. In this case, Pilate was scared. A second reason... Another fear is watching how riled up the Jews were over Jesus, screaming their demands to have him crucified, and he had said he was innocent and they should crucify him. Now, Pilate had claimed him innocent. They're screaming crucify. All this stirred the pot. So, in addition to this superstitious fear that was coming Pilate now feared a riot, a revolt from the Jews over this. And as a prefect, he did not want this. Uh, rulers generally don't want riots where they rule. If this was the case, then those over 
Pilate would take it out on him and he would be deposed or worse. So he feared this also. So this whole situation is what we would call volatile. The third element we've not looked at before. We didn't look at the verse, but we will now. His wife. His wife had sent him a message while he was on the judgment seat earlier. Now listen to this. This is also interesting. and You can see how it would add fuel to the fear, especially to someone who's superstitious. Listen to this verse carefully because the situation, the timing of it is important. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. First of all, to some Romans, those deep into their idol worship and superstition, dreams meant something. But note the situation, note the timing. Pilate was on the judgment seat, the Bema seat deliberating with the Jews. And these Jews were calling for Barabbas, Barabbas to be released and what they wanted to do with Jesus. Pilate has declared him innocent. They're declaring him guilty and needs to be crucified. He gets this message while he's talking to him about it, about his wife having this dream. And notice what she says. Have nothing to do with that righteous man. That means he's innocent. And he believes he was innocent. Now she says he's innocent. And she had a dream about it. So he is really mixed in his emotions and what he should be doing on this. Now, notice her reason. This dream had caused her great suffering. It must have been a horrible, horrifying nightmare. And she declares to her husband, have nothing to do with him. Basically, uh, get away from him. Let him go. Well, Pilate had to just stay with it, though. He, he was in a real, what we call between a rock and a hard place. He goes back inside, and he starts another round of questions with Jesus. Maybe he can get some answers here and get himself out of this mess. Verse 19. Remember I told you how the scene changes from going inside to outside, and here we have it going on again. He goes back inside this time. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus did not give him an answer. So Pilate goes back inside and asks Jesus this simple question, where are you from? Now, we've seen Pilate assume Jesus may have been from Galilee, and that's why he sent him over to Herod. Um, and Jesus told him that his kingdom was not earthly. Now, this just adds to the mystery and the, uh, the bewilder bewilderment of Pilate. Now there's a possibility he may really be a god or some sort of heavenly being. He says he's not. He doesn't tell me he's from here. And he also tells me his kingdom's not of this earth. So we can just see, rather than him understanding this is for what it is, it just builds his super superstition and his fear. Well, he can't get a satisfactory answer from Jesus. Now this would anger him further. Prisoners were expected to answer the questions. Verse 10. So Pilate said to him, You do not speak to me. Do you know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? This shows Pilate's anger. He reminds Jesus of the power he has over Jesus. 
Doesn't Jesus realize who Pilate is? He can release Jesus or have him crucified any moment. Verse 11. You have no authority over me at all. Jesus replied, You have no authority over me at all unless it was given to you from above. The one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. This is another one of those verses where you seem to have uh, two statements or two thoughts together that don't quite fit. Well, let's look at the two messages here that Jesus is saying. First, Jesus replied, You have no authority over me at all unless it was given to you from above. Now, obviously, Jesus was referring to the authority given from heaven, from God. We've seen Jesus is from above, back in 331, very early. Any power or authority Pilate has is given from God. God is sovereign. That's one of the themes we see throughout this entire uh, series of exchanges during the arrest and the trials. Jesus is referring to the authority given from heaven, from God. So Jesus lets Pilate know that his little talk about power is not threatening to him. Jesus lets him know where the real, real power comes from. However, Pilate would likely not take it as his power coming from God. He would have taken it as his power coming from the higher Roman authority. So there's this constant uh, backlash, you might say, of misunderstanding so much of what Jesus says because Pilate has such a different frame of reference. But at the same time, we understand that when Jesus said these things, we know now it was going to be recorded for us. So we could read it, so we could understand. And watch how Jesus dealt with Pilate. Now there's some lessons here, just in the practical end of this. We as Christians can speak Christian language. By that I mean what we understand things to mean. And the audience can have a complete different misunderstanding. But Jesus had a purpose for this also. Jesus is staying in the frame of reference that he normally has for the sake of not only our uh, understanding of what he's saying, but also for Pilate. Pilate needs to understand that Jesus is working on a different plane here. He's a king of a different kingdom. He's from above himself. He doesn't talk about it here. But those in charge of Pilate are really from above. And that is where Jesus is from. And Jesus speaks sometimes on a heavenly realm. And those on earth don't get it. Now you might wonder why Jesus does that. They don't really understand. I think the best answer to that is, is this is where Jesus' thinking is all the time. He thinks in terms of heavenly things. And there's a lesson there for us too. Uh, we get too bogged down on earthly affairs, don't we? I'm worrying about things. I catch myself doing that too often. Concerned about this or that when I should just keep right on doing ministry and serving Christ. And that's something we all should learn. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Now the second thing here, the second statement deserves some more explanation. When Jesus says, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. So there seems to be this sudden change of direction here in Jesus' words and his thoughts. Jesus is telling Peter where his real authority came from. Then he switches to talking about who has the greater sin. Now this amounts to saying that this other person has greater sin than Pilate. The implication is that Pilate is guilty of doing something wrong 
but someone else is more wrong and more guilty. So the connection is the authority. He talked about authority, and now the connection of authority is where this other person is greater in guilt. Did you get that? The connection between these two statements, these two thoughts, is authority. And the one with the higher authority, or at least in this context, the one who has the highest authority, is more guilty. Now, what do we mean by this? Though Pilate has authority, and we've learned, as Jesus said, it is from God, he still exercises his authority, makes him guilty, he's still culpable. But the point now is there's someone else who exercised his authority that is more guilty. There was someone else in a higher position in this situation. So the focus is changed from authority to guilt. Let me put this, let me put it this way. Here Pilate is talking about how great his authority is, what he can do to Jesus. Jesus comes back and tells him that it did not originate from him, his authority, but from God. And then that Pilate is guilty of sinning in his decision. But he's not as guilty as someone else. It's less than another. Who is this another? Who is this person more guilty of greater sin than Pilate in this situation? Well, our first thought might be, might be Judas. After all, his betrayal of Jesus was very bad. Motivated through evil, uh, Satan himself. Now this is who I would say is the another, except that Judas has been out of the picture now. He's probably already dead. It appears that he hung himself shortly after his betrayal. Matthew 27, 3 through 10. <clears throat> and secondly, Judas is not the one who handed Jesus over to Pilate. It was Caiaphas, the current high priest who delivered Jesus over to Pilate. We have that phrase twice, 1830 and 35. So, Pilate is the one with the greater sin and the greater guilt. Um, Caiaphas is the one with the greater sin and the greater guilt than Pilate. Caiaphas, as the high priest, head of the Sanhedrin, and religious leader, had the most authority with the Jews. And he led those, the Sanhedrin, the leaders. So Caiaphas is the one with the most guilty. He's guilty in many ways. Think of it. He was a Jew as a priest with all the resources available to him. His blatant disregard for truth, for the evidence, and his own personal rejection of the Messiah. On the other hand, this situation came to Pilate, and he could have done the right thing had he courage to do so, examine the evidence, finding Jesus not guilty as he had, but he didn't let him go. He wouldn't do it, though he did try. So Caiaphas is the one who is more guilty than Pilate. Neither one is not guilty. Verse 12. From this point on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes or is against Caesar. Now, neither the blasphemy charge or the charge of sedition held any water with Pilate. He still seeks to release Jesus. But the Jews play what I just call the Caesar card. 
They threaten Pilate with what Caesar would do if Pilate releases him. They state it in clear terms that this is how Caesar is going to hear it. If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. Do you recall the earlier passage back in verse 8 that spoke of Pilate's fear of the Son of God? We just saw that a short time ago. On top of that, a possible riot could occur, and then he heard the, about the wife's dream, and all this spurred on this fear. Now add to that fear of Caesar getting involved if he does not do what the Jews want. Now this Caesar, of course, is a title for the emperor. Tiberius is his name. Let me give you some background here to help you better understand why this threat from the Jews was, taking, was taken most seriously. If we assume the trial is taking place in 33 AD, then the person who helped get Pilate his position in other words, he was a close to the emperor who helped Pilate get his position. There's a man by the name of, I'll just write it up here. Sejanus. We have usually pronounced it Sejanus, but Sejanus. This man who helped Pilate get his position with Tiberius Caesar has himself been executed by Tiberius Caesar. Once a friend of Tiberius, he came under superstition uh, and was executed by Tiberius along with his friends and family. So Pilate's inside man with the emperor Tyre, Tiberius is not only dead, but was considered a threat to Tiberius. So he was executed. So again, you have Tiberius Caesar. He's the emperor. So Janus had been a friend of him, helped Pilate get his position. And then so Janus was found to be, at least by Caesar, that he was dangerous and he had him killed. So Pilate no longer had a friend of Caesar. In fact, this man had become uh, somewhat of an enemy. So Pilate was already on shaky ground with Caesar. Now, the reason I mentioned the date was because if it was later on, this is when Sejanus would already have been killed, executed. Now, Pilate did not need any more negative reports, true or not, going to Tiberius about how he's ruling over Judea. Pilate is the ruler over the area of Judea. All right. Tiberius had a couple of negative reports already from the Jews uh, about Pilate, and one more like this, especially letting an enemy of Caesar's loose could be the end of Pilate's career. So Pilate took this threat seriously, and the Jews knew this, and they were manipulating the situation, and you got to see how they're pl paying, uh, playing this political game, that is, the Jews. They don't care for Caesar. They don't care for Rome. They don't care for Pilate but they want to get rid of Jesus. So they're going to play them off each other. They're going to play Pilate's fear of Caesar to get him to do what they want him to do with Jesus. It's interesting that the Jews, let's just kind of look at the, the players and their allegiances. The Jews, they were basically no friend of Rome either. Okay? No friend of Caesar, let's put it that way. And now they're going to claim that Pilate is no friend of Caesar. So they can get him scared to do what they want him to do. So they are cleverly manipulating Pilate in this situation. Threatening to make him look bad by saying he's trying to release someone who's against Rome. <clears throat> and we see here what is so typical today. It's a power play. It's about gaining power, holding power, 
while all the time disregarding truth and the very people who are concerned about truth. Folks, this is a good definition of politics. Playing power, ignoring the principles, that is, ignoring the truth of the matter, and just trying to get one's way by playing one person off the other. This is what makes politics so sickening, is the constant dishonesty about it. Well, Pilate's going to do something that he really doesn't want to do. We've seen his admission three times already that he declares Jesus guilty. He really wanted to let him go. He sought to let him go. But now this was kind of the last straw. Verse 13. Now listen to this. This is interesting too. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, basically this threat, <clears throat> he brought Jesus out. Now they're back out. And sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement. But in Hebrew, Gabbatha. So Pilate brings Jesus back out of the praetorium. Here we are back outside. He sets him on the bema. That's the judgment seat. Let me just give you a little definition of this. I'll just put the whole thing up here. This is the bema or the judgment seat. Usually a raised platform upon which a seat was placed and judgments were made by the presiding judge. It's the same word for the judgment seat of God and the judgment seat of Christ. Romans 14.10, 2 Corinthians 5.10. We also see this term, the payment. The payment, from what we know, was a hard surface. <clears throat> Basically what we would call a payment. But it was made up of blocks of stone. Or some sort of mosaic. It was a hard surface and they would set this seat out front uh, on this high uh, area and the one who was the judge would make a decision and then we have this little word gabatha that's just the hebrew name for it or the aramaic <clears throat> now before we leave this verse i want to point out another possible translation now this is this is a stretch but i wanted to show it to you anyway and if this really happened, <clears throat> this translation was accurate, if this is really the one that happened, then this would be rather shocking, at least it would be to the Jews. And here's the other translation. Therefore, when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judgment seat at a place called the payment, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now this turns on the use of the verb for seat. Transitive use or intransitive use. Um, and just remember, right after this, in verse 14, Pilate declares, here is your king. So, did Pilate come out and set Jesus on his seat just to mock the Jews and say, here is your king? Well, it sounds like a possibility. But here's a couple of problems with this view, and I just wanted to show you the view um, because that's one of those things where you might want to keep in mind how far this mocking went. But to use this as a transitive verb here is very rare. Uh, also, Pilate would be combining the idea of a king and judge, which seems to be a problem. Basically, he, he's claiming to be king. He doesn't, did, didn't claim to be judge. But Pilate sets him on the judgment seat, which seems a conflict in this context. Uh, if it was going to be more accurate, they would set Jesus in the governor's seat, uh, like more like a king than the judge's chair. But isn't, isn't there I irony here if that was really the case here because he is also the judge? Okay, but I go with the translation I have. Most everybody does that I can see, but it is a possibility in the Greek. So listen, <clears throat> here's the kind of overview of what's going on. We have the highest court among the Jews making a decision. That's the Sanhedrin. That's their, uh, that's their supreme court, you might say, the highest court. I'm just going to write high court 
combined with the highest ranking ruler of Rome that is there. So you got the ruler of Rome. Even had another one weigh in on it, Herod Antipas, but he didn't add anything. And he is on the judgment seat, this ruler of Rome. And he's about to judge the, the judge of all mankind, Jesus Christ. And of course, the Sanhedrin and Pilate, I would say they haven't had a clue, but they've had lots of clues. They've just ignored them. And to think that in the future, what a turnaround at the last judgment this will be when Jesus will be judging them, the last judgment. Verse 14. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Look, your king. Now this just follows our previous verse where they bring Jesus out to make the judgment. Let's look at some of these phrases because this helps us with the timing of things. Now it was the day of preparation. This is preparation for the next day Sabbath. So, this day in which this is happening right now is a Friday. Notice it's a day of preparation for the Passover. So the Passover is the following Sabbath. They're the same day. It was the sixth hour. Roman time, this would be 6 a.m. So this is still very early in the morning. Now, I will tell you, there was scholarly debate over several phrases here regarding the Passover, the timing of it, even the sixth hour. I give you my interpretation. You can dig into some of the scholarly activity here and see all the writings and see the debates back and forth of what was which, and they will have a lot of these things on a different time frame than what I presented it, presented, how I presented it uh, over the last uh, a couple of months of this study. Pilate speaks and says, look, your king. There's Jesus, beaten, bloody, helpless, totally at the mercy of Pilate, probably still tied up, and he says, look, your king. This is disdain for the Jews. Their king looking like this, mocking He's mocking them and shaming Jesus. This is Pilate's way of insulting the Jewish leadership at this point. They had him in a fix. They had him in a trap. But he still wants to get his digs in, as we would say. <clears throat> Let's just pause here and look at a... Uh, I started drawing this up several lessons back, and we looked at it, and I want to bring us up to date on a little bit. I'm just going to look at the... Uh, the days of we're most concerned with here. Let's see if I can get it up there the way I want. Remember that. Um, well, we just I think I can get almost get the whole thing up there. Let's see. Oh, I need to go just a little. Here we are. <clears throat> Let's just pick it up on Thursday down here towards the middle. We had the Last Supper, the Upper Room Discourse. Of course, we also had the prayer. There is the betrayal and the arrest. Now, we don't know exactly what time it is, if it's past midnight or not, but is these events are happening late into the evening and early morning. We have the six hearings or trials. The crucifixion is going to start at 9 a.m. We are in Friday now at this point in our study. The crucifixion is a few hours away, probably uh, between... Uh, it's between 6 and 9 a.m., the current events that are going on right now in our study. And as we see, 
the Sabbath starts the following evening. That's why they had to get Jesus on the cross and have him die so they could get him off the cross and get him buried before the Sabbath started. So it's all a time crunch for them to get all this done. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so let's go back and pick it up at verse 15. Pilate has just brought Jesus out and says, Look, your king. Well, they see Jesus all beaten and bloodied in this crown of thorns and this robe on him. He's an object of, of uh, disdain right now. What do they do? Verse 15. <clears throat> so they cried out, Take him away. Take him away. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Now, <clears throat> my tone here is important because that's key to interpretation. Uh, Pilate's making fun of them. They're not going to have it. So they say, We have no king but Caesar. Now, these are things that you just don't say. They were taken seriously it would change the matter dramatically if they really recognized jesus as their king if they really believed that they had no king but caesar these have big repercussions so this bantering keeps going back and forth pilate's getting his digs in here when he says shall i crucify your king again another insult another scorn a barb at the jews then their final answer the chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Now, notice the chief priests said this. They're probably the only ones that had the nerve to say it. Remember that the chief priests were more politically aligned with the Romans. It was the Romans who appointed the high priest now. But devoted Jews, even those opposing Christ, would never call Jesus, or excuse me, call Caesar their king. That's how I pointed out the chief priest said it. Now, they wouldn't call Caesar their king, but even the chief priest here, I should say the chief priest are saying it here, they're the only ones that probably had the nerve to say it, because this is something you just didn't do as a Jew, claim Caesar to be your king. But notice what's really going on here. <clears throat> They're all rejecting Jesus as the Messiah. And for the Jews to hear their leaders say Caesar is their king, or join in, join in with them, or even stand for this, goes against, goes against much of what makes a Jew a Jew. The scriptures teach that the king of Israel is God. Now you might say, but what about all those other kings that sit on the throne of Judah and, and the northern kingdom of Israel. Well, the kings of Judah and the line of David were actually vassal kings. Now, a vassal king is basically a king who depends upon a higher king. So the actual viewpoint was that the king of God's people is God and God alone. But he appoints vassal kings. Kings whose allegiance was to the higher king. Okay? So this would be David. They're kings, but lesser kings. The point is, to say that Caesar is king is where Pilate pushed the Jews to this outright rejection of Jesus as their king. So he's pushed them and pushed them, and they come back with this line that was even out of character for them. Now, let me fill in a couple of things that happen about this time that you often see or hear about in the uh, story of the Passion or uh, surrounding the crucifixion and the arrest 
John doesn't talk about them, but Matthew does. So I'm just going to read a short portion from Matthew about a couple of things that you're familiar with, uh, probably from just hearing about the Passion. I mention them because that's their cause. They're well known, and John doesn't. So here's about the place they would have happened. Matthew 27, 24. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, here's that fear he had, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, His blood shall be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas for them. But having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Now, is this a second scourging of Jesus? Is this the one that was so serious it almost killed him? So, if this was a place for a second scourging, this would have been the most serious. And this makes some sense because we know that Jesus wasn't able to carry the cross. So this would have been a horrible uh, uh, level, the most serious, where he was beaten nearly to death, as I described earlier. Well, let's go back to John. Verse 16, our final verse. So he then handed him over to them to be crucified. And then this starts actually the next sentence, the next verse, which we'll continue next time. Therefore they took Jesus. Pilate hands Jesus over them to have him crucified. But it is the Roman soldiers who's going to carry this out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word today. It's been challenging. It's been enlightening. And we ask now that your spirit will challenge us with what we've heard, that we might properly apply and understand the depth and the love to which Jesus went on our behalf. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.